Diffusion, Osmosis, and Mitosis Diffusion and osmosis are important physical properties in all biological processes. Diffusion and osmosis control the movement of ions, water, and some nutrients in living systems. The proper working of every cell in your body depends on the two basic principles of diffusion and osmosis. Let's first define diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of a substance from an area of higher concentration to one of lower concentration. Osmosis is the diffusion of water through a semi-permeable membrane. Osmosis is indeed a form of diffusion. While diffusion can occur across areas that don't involve a semi-permeable membrane, osmosis takes water in or out of the cell based on the surrounding liquid's concentration gradient. How are osmosis and diffusion similar? They are similar in that both osmosis and diffusion equalize the concentration of two substances. Both diffusion and osmosis are passive transport processes, which means they do not require any input of energy to occur. Also, in both diffusion and osmosis, particles move from an area of higher concentration to one of lower concentration. What about the differences between osmosis and diffusion? Osmosis is limited to only one liquid medium, water, whereas diffusion occurs in liquids other than water, gases, and even solids. Osmosis requires a semi-permeable membrane, whereas diffusion does not require a semi-permeable membrane. Osmosis depends on the number of solute particles dissolved in a solvent, whereas diffusion depends on the presence of other particles. Osmosis requires water for the movement of particles, whereas diffusion does not require water for the movement of particles. Brownian motion. The driving force of diffusion and osmosis is the random movement of particles known as kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion and occurs in all states of matter, liquids, solids, and gases. Kinetic energy does not stop until a substance is lowered down to an extremely low temperature. All motion ceases at absolute zero or zero Kelvin. Absolute zero is much, much colder than zero degrees Fahrenheit or centigrade. Absolute zero is equal to negative 273 degrees Celsius. Recall, water freezes at zero degrees centigrade. One of the first persons to observe this random motion of particles was Robert Brown in 1827. He incorrectly assumed that this motion was due to living activity. Brownian motion, as it is now called, occurs when visible particles are constantly bombarded by very small particles called colloids. Colloids are one one millionth to one one ten thousandth millimeters in diameter. Brownian motion is necessary to keep the colloid particles within living cells from settling out in solution. On a microscope slide, when we place a drop of milk that has been diluted in water, we can observe the fat globules and their motion. You should be able to see that larger globules move more slowly than the smaller droplets. Heavier or larger particles will move more slowly and so will have a slower rate of diffusion. The kinetic energy is directly proportional to the mass of the object and to the square of its velocity. In plain English, smaller particles diffuse more quickly than larger ones. Diffusion is the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. The definition that was explained earlier had no limitation on the state of matter in which diffusion could occur. What this means is that diffusion can possibly occur across solids, liquids, or gases. The definition also did not put any limitations as to the type of particle undergoing diffusion. But again, common sense would dictate that diffusion cannot occur with a tennis ball across concrete walls due to the size of the particle. Diffusion depends on the size of the particle 
as well as whether or not the particles are polar or nonpolar. Let's look at how solubility would affect diffusion. In this virtual exercise, we will examine the movement of three colored solutions diffusing within a semi-solid medium called auger. To do this, we obtain a petri plate that's partially filled with auger. We'll use a cork bearer to make three small holes into the auger. Then, we'll fill each of these holes with a different solution. Sudan will be depicted as red, potassium permanganate will be depicted as purple, and malachite green will be depicted in this experiment as green. This is how your plate would look at the beginning of the experiment. 60 minutes later, let's suppose your petri plate looks like this. Now, we can take a ruler and measure the diameter in millimeters for each of our spots. Let's measure potassium permanganate. In our experiment, potassium permanganate traveled 10.5 millimeters. Be sure to write your data in the data table. Next, let's measure Sudan 4. Sudan 4 measures about 5 millimeters. Now, we'll measure malachite green. Malachite green measured about 8.5 millimeters. We recognize that potassium permanganate was able to diffuse further than both Sudan 4 and malachite green. Let's look at why this might be the case. When looking at the molecular weight, we see the molecular weight for potassium permanganate being much lower than that of Sudan 4 and malachite green. Also, potassium permanganate has the lowest solubility of water, but it's fairly close to the other two. This supports the fact that smaller molecules diffuse more quickly than larger ones. We also saw that Sudan 4 was the smallest and diffused more slowly than malachite green or potassium permanganate. Looking at the data on your data table, can you explain why this might be the case? I'll let you answer this one on your own. When you're ready, let's move on. How would solubility affect diffusion? If many lipid droplets are placed in an aqueous environment, the liquid droplets want to come together to form a larger lipid droplet. They do this because lipids, or fats, are not water-soluble. Creating these larger lipid droplets decreases the rate of diffusion. The blood and cells of the body must be at osmotic equilibrium. This means that net osmosis must be roughly equal inside and outside of the cells. Solutions that have equal concentrations of particles inside the cell as well as outside the cell are said to be isotonic. In an isotonic solution, the amount of water transported into the cell will equal the amount of water transported out of the cell. Thus, the solute concentration inside the cell is equal to the solution outside the cell. Solutions that have an unequal osmotic balance are said to be either hypertonic or hypotonic. Hypertonic solutions cause crenation. If the solution surrounding a cell is high in salt concentration, it must be low in water concentration. This is called a hypertonic solution. In this solution, water moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Thus, water tends to flow out of the cell and into the salty environment. Cells placed in this environment would shrivel up as the water exits in a process referred to as crenation. Hypotonic solutions cause lysis. If the cell was placed into distilled water, the cell would swell and burst in a process known as lysis. This type of solution is called hypotonic. Lysis would occur because the high concentration of water on the outside of the cell would cause water to flow into the lower concentration of water inside the cell. You should note that the intracellular fluid inside of our cells has about 0.9% salt solution. When we take some blood cells and add them to an isotonic solution of 0.9% 
we can see that the solution remains cloudy. The cells have not undergone lysis or crenation. The solution looks cloudy because the red blood cells are still intact and diffuse light as it passes through the test tube. When we place red blood cells into a hypotonic solution, the cells will burst and undergo lysis and therefore do not diffuse light. Here, the solution would turn a clear red color. Red blood cells placed in a hypertonic solution will shrivel up in a process called crenation. Here, we will see that the solution appears cloudy because the cells are intact, just shriveled up, but the crenation cells are more dense, making them fall towards the bottom of the test tube. In this solution, we will see the top of the solution appearing more clear with the dense crenated red blood cells falling towards the bottom of the tube. So what is considered isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic in the human body? A normal saline solution has a concentration that is similar to tears, blood, and other bodily fluids. This is about 0.9% saline. It is also considered an isotonic solution. An isotonic solution would be a solution with a salt concentration that is equal to 0.9%. A hypertonic solution would be a solution having a salt concentration above 0.9%. And a hypotonic solution would be a solution with a salt concentration below 0.9%. Mitosis. Let's begin our discussion by looking at the surface area of a cube. A cube has six sides, even though you can only see a maximum of three sides at any one time. Surface area is the sum of the number of squares exposed to the outside surface. To calculate the surface area, you must multiply the height times the width of one side times the total number of sides. For example, in figure A, in this cube, you would multiply a height of two blocks times the width of one side, which is also two blocks, times the number of sides which is six sides. This gives us a surface area of 24. In figure B, we have this cube. To calculate the surface area of this cube, we must multiply the height, which is four blocks, times the width of one side, which is another four blocks, times the number of total sides, which is six sides. The answer here is 96. Let's compare these values. When we formulate the volume of these cubes, for figure A, the volume of a cube is calculated by multiplying the height, which is two blocks, times the width, which is two blocks, times the length, which is two blocks, giving us a volume of eight. For figure B, the volume of the cube is calculated by multiplying the height, which is four blocks, times the width, which is four blocks, times the length, which is four blocks. This gives us a volume of 64 blocks. Next, let's look at the surface area to volume ratio. For figure A, we found the surface area to be 24 and the volume to be eight. To find the surface area to volume ratio, we'll divide the surface area by the volume or 24 divided by eight, which equals three. The surface area to volume ratio for figure B will be its surface area divided by its volume, or 96 divided by 64, or 1.5 blocks. When we compare the surface area to volume ratio for figure A and figure B, we can see that as the size of an object increases, the surface area to volume ratio decreases. The lower the surface area to volume ratio, the higher the rate of diffusion. For example, let's look at the ears of an elephant. The elephant flaps its ears in order to stay cool. Flapping the ears accomplishes this in two different ways. First, it acts as a fan to move the air over the rest of the elephant's body and it cools the blood 
as it circulates through the veins in the ears. The ears of the elephant have a large surface area and a small volume. Its surface area to volume ratio is then said to be small. This small surface area to volume ratio gives us a higher rate of diffusion, allowing the heat from the elephant's blood supply to dissipate and exit its skin entering the surrounding area, thereby cooling the elephant. Chromosomes. Let's look at the structure of a chromosome. Chromosomes have two arms called chromatids. These chromatids are connected by a structure known as the centromere. Chromosomes are coiled structures made up of DNA and associated proteins. Chromosomes are the form of genetic material of the cell during cellular division. It is this coiled structure that ensures the proper segregation of the chromosomes during cell division. During telophase, chromosomes begin to uncoil and form chromatin. This prepares the genetic material for directing the metabolic activities of new cells. When looking at the cells undergoing different phases of cellular division under a microscope, we can see the different stages. Here, we see different stages of mitosis in the onion root tip. Onion root tips have 16 chromosomes, or eight pairs. The chromosome number of the onions can be expressed as 2n equals 16. Looking at stages of mitosis in the whitefish blastula can be a bit more challenging. Here are some images of the different stages of mitosis in the whitefish. Thank you for watching.